All right, Physicsy, let's go over the calculus-based kinematics that might be on the Physics C exam. Last time we learned that if you take a position versus time graph, calculate the derivative of it, or the slopes, you can get a velocity versus time graph. Here's how you can remember that. The definition of velocity is change in x over change in time. Change the deltas to d's, and there you go. You can see that velocity is the derivative of x based on time. Similarly, if you plot the slopes of a velocity versus time graph, you get an acceleration versus time graph. The definition of acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. In calculus, that's the differential of velocity in accordance to time. Going in the reverse direction is when you take the area under the line. That's basically taking the integral as base to time, and that tells you how to change the velocity on the velocity versus time graph. And if you go in this direction and calculate the areas under the velocity versus time graph, you're basically taking the integral of velocity over time. That tells you how to change your position on the position versus time graph. Let's learn another concept that's very important. Notice every time that the velocity versus time graph is a value of zero. That corresponds to every time the slope equals zero on the position versus time graph. This goes to show you that when the velocity is zero, that means you either have a relative minimum or a relative maximum on your position versus time graph. Relative minimums happen when you have concave up curves, and relative maximums occur when you have concave down curves. And that depends on the acceleration. Similarly, if you look at the acceleration time graph and where it's zero, that corresponds to relative maximums and relative minimums on the velocity versus time graph. Okay, let's talk about the scenario when you have a position time graph that's not linear and you try to use the linear velocity formula on it. Okay, let's say I want to find the velocity between 3 and 5. Well, I draw a line between those two points. I can do rise over run. I plug that into my rise over run formula, and I get 10 meters for every 2 seconds, meaning 5 meters per second. Now, obviously, the object is not moving a constant 5 meters per second in that time period. So what did I calculate? Well, I actually calculated the average velocity and that velocity occurs at that moment right there at about four seconds and this should remind you of the mean value theorem in calculus a b so basically here's the moral of the story if you use delta x over delta t without doing a derivative you're calculating the average velocity not the instantaneous especially if the graph has a curve So we learned the uniform accelerated motion equations, and we derived them using algebra. I'm going to show you how to derive them using calculus. You're going to find out that the calculus approach is pretty quick. So uniform accelerated motion says that A is uniform. In other words, the acceleration is a constant number that does not change. A does not depend on time. Now, velocity is the integral of acceleration. So take this formula, I multiplied delta t on both sides. I'm going to integrate both sides. The integral of dv is just v. And a is a constant, so he goes out of the integral. And the integral of dt is t. Now, you should know that when you do an indefinite integral that you have to add a constant. But here's the trick in physics. What is that constant? Well, that's the initial velocity. You name the letter the same thing as what's on the opposite side of the equation. Okay, that's the formula that's on your AP physics formula chart for uniformly accelerated motion. Now, we're going to do the position is the integral of the velocity. I'm going to write that out. The differential of dx is x. I'm going to plug in the velocity formula and take the integral of that. And that's when you bump up the sign and then divide by it. 
So we're going to get one half AT squared plus VIT. Am I done? Absolutely not. Remember, we have to add the constant. And since the equation equals X, my constant is going to be X with the little I saying that's my initial position. And that is the polynomial that we have gotten so familiar with this year. Now let's talk about scenarios where uniform accelerated motion does not apply. Take, for instance, this question right here. Stop the video and read the question. All right, welcome back. So basically, a scientist has developed a velocity formula to describe an impact of an airplane into the water. The airplane is 5,000 kilograms. And the equation is only valid for a certain period of time. Past time t, the equation is no longer valid to describe the physics of what's going on. Let's answer question number one. What's the initial impact velocity of the airplane? This is really easy because this is the velocity formula. This formula tells you what the velocity is at any given time. Now, initial implies that the time is zero. So I plug in the number zero, and we get the velocity was four meters per second the moment the airplane hit the water. It's typically acceptable not to write units when you deal with these type of questions because they get complicated. But we know that the units for velocity is meters per second. Question two asks us to find the net force on the airplane. Net force is another way of saying sigma f. We're solving for sigma f as if it was one variable. Now, Newton's second law says that that equals to ma. I need to know the acceleration. But they gave us the velocity. Now, to get the acceleration equation, I'm going to take the derivative. Because the derivative of velocity is the acceleration. I derive the formula, use the power rule, and the 4 disappears. The t becomes negative 5, and the t squared becomes positive 2t. That's the power rule. Now I want you to notice that this proves that this is non-uniform accelerated motion. The acceleration depends on time. As time goes on, the acceleration is increasing and increasing. And that rate of increase is 2. I'm going to introduce a new concept for you. It's called jerk. Jerk is a change in acceleration over time. Jerk is not really on the Physics C exam. I just want you to know the terminology for changing your acceleration over time. All right, I'm going to take that formula and plug it back into my F equals MA. And that's the polynomial. I plug in the mass, which is 5,000. I use the distributive law. And there you go. That's the equation for force at any given moment. And now let's move on to... Question three asks, how deep does the airplane go? Well, deep is definitely a measurement of displacement. So I'm going to have to take my velocity formula and integrate it to get the expression for position. And as you can see, if I use the bump up the sign and divide by that new exponent using the reverse power rule, that's my polynomial describing where it's at. Notice how we have a t cubed. That stems from the fact that this is non-uniform accelerated motion. Oh, you probably are like, you forgot to add the constant. You're right. But that constant's about to go away because I'm going to define the surface of the water to be xi0. So he disappears. The airplane hits the water. The question is, is how far will it go? Well, that will happen when the airplane comes to a stop. The airplane's going to go, 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 and then it comes to a stop. And that's how deep it goes. So, so what I'm going to do is calculate the velocity when it equals zero, plug it into the X formula, and then check the concavity of it. So the airplane comes to a stop when it gets to its deepest depth. That's the definition of deepest. The airplane comes to a stop because it's going to go the opposite direction. 
I complete the square and find that that is t minus 4 times t minus 1. And there's a critical time at 4 and a critical time at 1. Meaning the velocity is 0 at time 4 and time 1. I'm going to pick the earlier time because it's the one relevant. I'm figuring out the deepest from the moment it crashed, which was time equals 0. The sooner time is 1. I plug that time into my position formula. And I calculate it and find out that the position one second in is 2.833 meters. Now, how do I know that's the maximum depth, the deepest depth? Well, I plug in my value t equals 1 into my acceleration formula. Come to find out that the acceleration is negative 3. So if my acceleration is negative 3, that means I have a concave down form on my position time graph. And therefore, yes, indeed, I have calculated a maximum value. The next question is, is find the time t wherein the airplane returns to the surface. Well, this one's not going to be too easy, but conceptually, that's not going to be hard because I have the position formula. And I'm asking myself, hey, when does the airplane get back to zero? So I'm going to plug in zero for my x value. I factor out a t, and that gives me one of my zeros. Obviously, the airplane was at the surface at time equals zero. The question is, is what's the next time that it's back at zero? I'm going to find a common denominator for those guys in those parentheses, factor out that six, and now I have a polynomial where I need to find its zeros. So to do that, I'm going to use the quadratic formula or you could use a graphing calculator, it's up to you. And I'm going to find out that there are two times when the airplane goes back to zero, except that you're going to pick the sooner time because that's the one more relevant. And now we know that this scientific equation only applies from zero seconds to 2.3 seconds. Let's talk about simple harmonic motion from the lens of calculus based kinematics. So actually, the topic we're about to talk about is probably not going to be tested on the AP exam, but it gives us a good view of how to use derivatives to solve for things. So stop the uh, video and read this question. OK, welcome back. All right, so we're given the position formula. And the position formula is a form of cosine. OK? Uh, capital A is the amplitude, capital T is the period, and period is defined as the amount of time it takes to do one cycle. So the first question is, is develop an expression for velocity, acceleration, and force. So this is going to be pretty simple because we know that velocity is the derivative of position and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And then I can use F equals MA for the net force. On the left side, I drew the unit circle. The X axis of the unit circle has to do with cosine, and the Y axis has to do with sine. Now, that's a useful thing to draw out because it teaches you how to do the derivatives. The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. And the derivative of that goes back to sine. So it's kind of a cycle. Uh, and integration would be the opposite direction. So where we went clockwise for the derivatives, integrating would be counterclockwise. So our function is negative cosine. That means that the velocity is going to be the derivative of that. And the derivative of negative cosine is sine. And don't forget that we have to take the inner derivative of the function and multiply it out. Now, let's figure out what the acceleration is. Well, if I derive the velocity, I'm deriving a sine function, and the derivative of sine is cosine. And once again, I multiply out the inner derivative, and that's the acceleration. So as you can see here, it's not always the power rule. Sometimes we have trigonometric functions that we need to find the derivatives. Now, to find the force, obviously, I'm just going to take my acceleration equation and multiply little m to get my force. 
and we have answered the question. So to answer part two and three, okay, to answer questions two and three, uh, we're going to look at the graphs. So the displacement graph is the blue one on the far left, the velocity one is in the middle, and the acceleration on the right. Okay, and let's analyze the motion at four different points, starting with point zero. So we can see here from point zero that when the object is at negative amplitude, its speed is zero. But the acceleration net force is positive one. A quarter into the motion, at a quarter of the period, the object is at zero, the speed is at a maximum value, and the acceleration is also zero. Halfway through the motion, it's at the other side, at the maximum amplitude, the speed stops again, and now the acceleration and net force would be down and negative. And three fourths away of the period, the displacement is zero, the speed is at a maximum value but going in the opposite direction, and the net force is zero. Let's look at a graphic organizer to help us remember this. And kind of, it's logical, okay? So basically, when it's at the negative amplitude, its velocity is zero. It had to stop. That's why it's at its maximum position. But the spring is really stretched, and so it's going to pull all of its acceleration toward the up to get it back in the upward direction. And once that force is applied, midway through the motion, the velocity is at its maximum value, but there's no force on it. But it keeps going because of inertia until it gets to its maximum amplitude where it stops again. And there, the spring is really compressed, and so it's going to push with a maximum acceleration in the bottom direction. Then it starts to move, but now in the opposite direction. The fastest value occurs at an amplitude of zero. And finally, when it gets back to where it started, it comes to a stop again, and the spring is going to pull it back. And it's going to do this for a long time. I also would like to mention how this matches up with Hooke's Law that we learned for springs, which basically says that the force of a spring is directly proportional to how much you stretch it. So at the amplitude points, you have the max force. 